She said to Annie, Annie, please do this for your mom. I want you to attend the meetings that Brother Joseph Bates will do in this particular location. So Annie Smith, okay, mom, you know, you, you know, we have those moms, you know, we're just, okay, whatever, just to shut you up. You know, so they stop bugging you. And so she went. But actually, before that, the night before, Annie Smith had a dream. She dreamt that she went to the meeting and that she went, at, she's, she was late and she sat on the last pew. And then she saw the man who was preaching. And so she, when she woke up, she's like, that's a weird dream, you know, I, that's really weird. So the next day she said she, she tried to be as early as possible. Now, the same night, the night before, Joseph Bates had the same dream. She, he dreamed that he was preaching and he saw this lady come late and that she sat at the last pew. And it seemed like the Lord was telling him, change your topic. Because his, his topic was supposed to be on Daniel 8.14, the prophecies. And the Lord said to him, change your topic and make it, um, where was that? Change the topic into something else, okay? It was something else. So what he did, he changed his topic. And when he was preaching, right there and there, you know, the, the, the dream happened. Annie Smith was late, although she left the house early, she got lost, and so she was late. And came in, there were no more seats, so she sat at the back. So after the, the meeting, Annie Smith was just, man, my dream just happened. So she went towards the preacher, Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates was also excited to meet her because he dreamed of her. And so they were talking, and as the Holy Spirit convicted their hearts, Annie Smith decided that she would go back to the church. And she said, you know what, this is not just something that can happen accidentally. I know the Lord wanted me to be here. And so as a result, uh, Annie Smith became a very active member of the church. And in fact, she later was invited by James White to write for the Review and Herald. If you know the Review and Herald, it's a publishing house. But unfortunately, it burned a few years ago because they were publishing books that... Are not godly. So, anyways, the Review and Herald. She worked for the Review and Herald, and she published a lot of poems. And at the and at the age of what did she die? She if she died 1855, what age was that? 27. And that's very young. Okay. Why tuberculosis at that time did not have a cure as yet. Okay. But actually, in the writings of Ellen White. Um, Annie Smith got sick because she was actually lovesick. Okay? You don't die from loving someone and getting heartbreak. That's true. But there's this guy, and his name is J.N. Andrews. You are familiar with J.N. Andrews. This is like the, the gossip for the pioneers. But J.N. Andrews, um, you know, his name is where Andrews University is based from. He's the first missionary for, international missionary for the Seventh-day Adventists. Anyways, Jade Andrews and Annie Smith were working together in the Review and Herald, and of course, they're both young, and you know, they kind of like have feelings for each other. And of course, you know, the way that they did dating at that time, called courting, is that you know, you have to ask permission from parents or from the guardian and stuff, but somehow Jane Andrews did not go through the protocol and made Annie feel that, you know, hey, I like you. But then at the end, Jay and Andrews did not marry Annie Smith and married someone else. And Annie Smith was heartbroken. And Ellen White wrote, and she actually wrote that she said, the cause for the death of Annie is because of you, Jay and Andrews, because, because you led her on, you know? So guys, don't lead, don't lead the feelings of girls if you're not really interested. Um, so she was led on and it led her to, you know, get sick and she was thinking about it and she cannot function anymore as a writer for the Adventist era. And then she got, you know, immune system got low, um, low and, you know, acquired the disease and she died. So that's one interesting story from the pioneers. So, 
um, Annie Smith. So she wrote a very interesting song, and it's actually in our hymnals as well. I saw one weary. Can you? Yeah, I saw one weary. Just look for it. And I don't have it in my slides, so if you have a hymnal in your phone, or we can look at the screen, okay? It's in hymnal, SDA hymnal 441, and it has four stanzas. And she wrote this particular hymn because she had a particular people in mind, okay? So the first stanza, I saw one weary, sad, and torn with eager steps pressed on the way who long the hallowed cross had borne, still looking for the promised day. So this particular person was describing Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates had long, um, you know, carried the cross of being, you know, he's the oldest pioneer alive during that time. And so he, she is describing him here. In the second stanza, she describes this particular person. I saw one with sword and shield, bold, and brave, you know, he fought a yielding on the field to win an everlasting crown. And this is James White. She's describing James White here. James White, very active in the church, always had new ideas, you know, always on the go. And then the third one is, and there was one who left behind the cherished friends of early years and honor, pleasure, welfare, sign to tread the path bedewed with tears. But through trials, deep and conflict, sorry, it was still a smile of joy he wore. I asked what going the spirits up with this and he the blessed hope. So people who were researching on this particular hymn said that it's Jay and Andrews. Okay? Jay and Andrews is, as I said, the first missionary. So he actually left his friends and family to go to a foreign country where nobody knows him and he doesn't know anyone as well. And his uncle, Jay and Andrews, is actually a very, very smart guy. Okay? Very, very smart. And he was offered by his uncle a scholarship to take law. But he did not accept that. Instead, he accepted the call to be a missionary. So they were thinking it, this might be Jay and Andrews. But at the same time, it could also be talking about Annie Smith. Because Annie Smith was a prominent uh, poet and a writer in, in, in her time. But she left that life to write for a small paper called Review and Herald. So she she left honor, pleasure, and wealth, you know? So they don't know, they're not sure whether it's Jane Andrews or it's Annie Smith. And then the fourth stanza is actually talking about all the pilgrims, all of us. While pilgrims here we journey on in this dark veil of sin and gloom, through tribulation, hate, and scorn, or through the portals of the tomb, and especially this is their experience. So let's try to, to sing this song a little fast. Uh,
pattern that she had because at every last part of the song, it actually asks a question. What, what keeps you going? And every time at the last part, it says, it's the blessed hope. No, it's the blessed hope. We have the hope that Christ is going to come again. Okay, I knew you were going to chant that. Okay, next one. Anyone familiar with Uriah Smith? Uriah Smith is, as you would guess, the brother, the younger brother of Annie Smith. At one point, Uriah Smith became the editor for the Review and Herald. He actually wrote the book, Daniel and Revelation, that Ellen White recommended to everyone who would study the prophecies, Daniel and Revelation, by Uriah Smith is the book to read. Uriah Smith is one-legged, okay? Something happened to him, an accident, and so he only has one leg. But you know, he's so smart, he made his own leg, wooden leg, and attaches to his, you know, leg. You know why he wanted another leg? Because he wanted to have the opportunity to kneel with both legs. So can you imagine? For us, when we say, oh, let's all kneel to pray, or, my, my knees hurt. But for him, it's a privilege to kneel that he made himself a leg, okay, so he can kneel. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't patent it, so we don't, we don't name the, the, the prosthetic leg to Uriah Smith today. But it was one of the very first. And um, so Uriah Smith was also wanting to have, you know, a contribution towards the hymnal. And he wrote this particular hymn that we're very familiar. Actually, I hear it in a lot of local churches. And what he did is the regular practice of the day. He would use a secular tune so that he, the, the people can easily, easily learn the songs. And actually, in this particular quote, it's, he wrote it in his autobiography, but he was quoting someone else. Joseph Clark was describing how they sounded like during worship service. I lately attended a conference where brethren and sisters from different sections were gathered, and it was good to see them there. I greatly rejoiced to greet those of like precious faith, but alas, when we sang, one prolonged a quarter note until it consumed the time of a whole note, with a hole and swell besides. Some were saying one verse, until others had progressed pretty well into the next, and the ending word of each verse echoed and re-echoed, each according to the different notions of propriety, which meant that there was people were singing behind, which each locality administered for itself with the evident idea that such notions were standard. So it was chaotic, that worship service. And so, like I told you a while ago, it was a must to put those notes in the hymnal so that they can all sing uniformly. And of course, also is to sing the, the songs in, in the secular tune of the day. So let's sing one song, just one stanza, Oh Brother Be Faithful. Your particular, you know this song, right? So let's just sing the first stanza, Oh Brother Be Faithful.
and you didn't know that it was written by Uriah Smith. Okay, yeah. So now you know Uriah Smith, and um, which is actually our forefather. Okay. So now that we're moving on to the part in the Adventist um, history where. Tell me what year were we organized, wherein we finally have the name Seventh-day Adventist Church. Anyone who knows? 1863, all right, good. So in 1863, finally we have a name. They decided to have a name for legal purposes and of course, organizing the church, finally. Uh, James White wanted to Make sure that the publishing house will go to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In case he dies, he knows legally that um, the stuff that they have acquired over time will go to the right people. So 1863, finally, we get a name. And starting from 1863, one person actually wrote a lot of hymns that up till today, we are still using his, his songs. And his name is Franklin Belden. Familiar with Franklin Belden, F.E. Belden. He is Ellen White's nephew, by the way. And um, Ellen White also has a twin sister, an older sister, and a brother. And Franklin Belden is actually the son of her older sister, Sarah. And Franklin Belden is known to be the most prolific, when you say prolific, someone who has written a lot of things, a lot of compositions for the SDA church in the 19th century. I don't know if there's anyone in the 20th century. Um, I would like to meet that person if he's still alive, but F.E. Belden so far has written most of our hymns. He's very talented. He wrote around 100 hymns, hundreds of hymns, and that was just when he was in... 20 years old, okay? So, very talented musician. This is how talented he is. And I'm challenged myself. What he will do is when he is in a worship service, normally the preacher will give the text, right? This is the scripture. And then he will expound on it. So, when Belden, when Franklin Belden hears the scripture, he would go out, he would write the hymn based on that particular verse, and by the time the preacher is done, he and his wife, who is also a musician, would sing the appeal song, the new song that he just composed while the, the preacher was preaching. Never heard anyone do that before. So that's how talented he was. He could write uh, a lot. Um, if you know, what is this song? Cover with his life, Whiter the Snow. Okay. Um, Holy Dine, also. So if you go to the back of the hymn, I'll just look for Franklin Belden, and then you will see all the list of the hymns that are in the SDA hymn. So he was very prolific. However, it's a very sad story. While S the SDA church has a lot of really nice stories and funny stories, Franklin Belden's story is actually a sad one. Why? Because in 1888, this is the big... Minneapolis meeting that they did and they were going to um, in this meeting they were going to have Jones uh, Wagoner A.T. Jones and Wagoner talk about the righteousness by faith Okay, they're trying to understand righteousness by faith and Franklin Belden who was there did not accept the message and Ellen White wrote to him for 15 years wrote to him and wrote to him and you know trying to win him over and say you have to believe this this is something that has to do with your salvation but Effie Belden somehow believed it and then the the child conference did something to him and he was turned off completely from the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist Church and he left okay so and even later on in his life when he died in 1907 he was very antagonistic he said that he does not have anything to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's a really, really sad story. But no one has really um, replaced F.E. Belden's songs. And we're still singing a lot of his songs during our, in our day. One of the songs that is very ironic is 
cover with his life, okay? Cover with his life, whiter than snow. Um, it really talks perfectly about the theory of righteousness by faith. And it's that, and I say it's ironic because he knows the theory, but he has not applied it in his life. And hopefully it, it will not be our story, wherein we know by theory what we believe in, but then it's not seen in our life, and we have not applied it. And anyone can be in danger of such attitude. I can be in that danger, you can be in that danger, okay? So, but one thing that I really, that I want to point out are two songs that he wrote for the church. It's, again, pregnant with doctrines, and that is Look for the Waymarks. Um, it's also in our hymnal. Look for the Waymarks, the great prophetic Waymarks, down through the ages. Um, again, this is something that is not sung so much in our church. And I would challenge you, musicians especially, try to promote the songs. All the hymns in our hymnals are good, but we are Seventh-day Adventist Church, and our Seventh-day Seventh Adventist, Adventist Church has written songs that are really distinct, something that really complements what we believe in. So let's try to learn this and teach it as well, share it to other people. Look for the way marks uh, him five nine six. Uh, where's my helper? Yeah, five nine six.
John Harvey Keller, Dr. John Harvey Keller. Okay. One of the doctors that we also hold so dear in our hearts, but we don't really, it's hard to do, we don't, it's actually hard to do, is the health message. Okay. And we know the Seventh-day Adventist Church I, is really uh, blessed to have such light. Okay. And as you would know, a lot of the pioneers were smokers. Okay, did you know that? They would have their worship service, and you know, someone smokes the tobacco. And stuff. Can you imagine? You know, J. M. Lockborough and all those people. Joseph Bates was the only one that was really a health reformer from the beginning. So J. M. Lockborough actually said in one of his testimonies that when when he learned of the truth of the about the Sabbath. It seemed like it didn't make sense that he was smoking and then, you know, the truths about the Sabbath are, are before him. So he stopped because of the Sabbath. He didn't know the health uh, aspect of it. Later on, Ellen White was, of course, given the message. And, you know, we cannot blame the pioneers because a lot of the doctors would prescribe smoking to cure you of any lung problems that you have, which is very ironic. You're, you're sick in the lungs, and therefore you smoke. You know, that was the, that, that's what they would say. And so, Ellen White wrote, if it is used as a medicine greatly, go to God. And those that use the filthy weed for medicine greatly dishonor God. And there is a bomb in Gilead. So, Ellen White is one of those people because he, um, James White and Ellen White are poor people they cannot afford a uh, ticket, you know, in the upper class in the, in the train. So they're always at the, you know, at the lower class. And there they would always sit with people who smoke. And they're always enveloped in, in tobacco smoke. And so she would faint, you know, and she cannot take it anymore. Ellen White is very sickly. And so she would write a lot about you know smoking and stuff and so John Harvey Kellogg the doctor for for the Seventh-day Adventist Church became uh, the president of what is this particular association American Health and Temperance Association so he, he was the president at the time and it's a national thing not just the Millerites but it's something that the whole whole America was um, it's known nationally and so we, as a president, he asked all the members of this association to sign a pledge. It was a teetotal pledge, which means that they should refrain from tobacco, from, from tea, from rum, from whiskey, from, from any kinds of alcohol. So everyone has to sign that pledge. And if you are a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you have to be a member of the American Health and Temperance Association. Very interesting. Uh, and so they were, and they were saying that to be a part of that association was also something that the Adventist Church can use to, what did Ellen White say? To evangelize those who are other members that are not of the same faith. So we received the health reform vision in what year? When did Ellen White receive the health reform message? Okay, 1863. All right. So right after they had the they had received the message, uh, I mean, having the name, they also received the health reform message. As God was organizing His church, He wanted at the very beginning that they would also understand the health message. And so, like I said, Joseph Bates. Even in 1821, early, early on, okay, he did not use any liquor. He did not chew tobacco or smoke tobacco. Or even, he did not even cuss or, you know, use profane language. In 1838, Joseph Bates did not, he stopped using tea and coffee. In 1843, he stopped eating meat, butter, grease, cheese, spice, rich cakes, and spices. However, even though he was practicing the health reform, Joseph Bates did not push it on people. 
That's the problem with us today. We push it on people, people get turned off, you know? So he allowed the, the pioneers to learn out the truth on their own terms, on their own time. And when they were, when they finally accepted it, you know, I, I mean, Joseph Bates must have been really happy. So the church got organized and as usual, and this is the case for music, even in the classical period and even our times today, whatever is happening in the society, music always reflects that, okay? And so during this time when they were learning about the health messages, of course, they have a song on health. And one of those songs is Smoking and Chewing. And this is a funny song actually because Smoking and Chewing actually talks about a lot of those guys that, that, that smoke. Chewing in the parlors, smoking in the street, chewing with cigar smoke, everyone you meet, spitting on the pavement, spitting on the floor. Is there such enslavement? Is there such a bore? So what happens is when they smoke, okay, and then they chew the tobacco, they would spit it anywhere. And so what happens is when you walk through the streets, and mostly a lot of the people walk, they would see a lot of spits uh, on the ground. And that actually talked about in second stanza. Puddles in the corner, and it's not, it's not a puddle of water, this is a puddle of spit, okay? Puddles in the corner swelling into one, forming lakes and rivers dying in the sun. You know, the, the composer is really funny because he's really exaggerating here. Yeah. And so it's there under the sun, it dries up. Maidens never marry men who smoke or chew. If they use tobacco, they will never do. Many carry spice to cinnamon and clothes. Make use of your eyesight, make use of your nose. For when you are married, spice they throw away, and your loving husband smokes and chews all day. And another, it was really a health hazard because especially the women at this time were wearing the long, long skirts, okay? Very long. And actually, when we, uh, we went to Battle Creek, you know, a dress would weigh 98 pounds. You know how heavy 98 pounds is? A dress. So every day, a woman will wear this. And, you know, long skirts trailing on the ground. And it's also heavy because they have a sort of a wire so that they look sexy and stuff. So they have that. And, you know, can you imagine the spits on the ground? Ladies walk there, and what happens? Okay, so all of that spit goes through the clothes, and it's very unhealthy. So aside from the smoke that they were, you know, inhaling. So let's try to learn this. You, you found it, smoking and chewing. It's kind of fast, and you know, like a happy, happy childish song, but it's very interesting. So let's, let's try to sing. melody just run through.
pronunciation. Almost, almost done. And it's, it's more uh, somber in such a way that it invites everyone not to yield to temptation. We're not going to sing it, but I like, I like how it, uh, what it says, yield not to temptation for yielding is sin, its victory will help you some other to win. Fight, fight manfully on our dark passion, subdue, look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. And that's really the point, you know. Jesus was tempted, we're all tempted. But the thing is, we should be able to gain that victory because God will help us. Okay, but if we're not struggling, then what, what, what victory is there to win? So the, 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 the refrain says, ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. For every temptation that we have in life, whatever that may be, if you ask Christ to help you, then he will help. So here is kind of like a little bit modern. Uh, C. Mervyn Maxwell, he wrote the textbook that we use a lot in our Daniel and Revelation classes, which is God Cares. Okay, C. Mervyn Maxwell is actually a professor for Andrews University, and he wrote two songs that are in the hymnal, so I'll, that's your assignment. Try to get a hymnal and see, look for C. Mervyn Maxwell and see what song he wrote, okay? And of course, before we end, and sing the last song, I would like to summarize uh, what we have been talking about so far this morning. We have learned that the Adventist message, or the Advent, Ad Adventist hymns were brought about because of the distinct messages that they were carrying. Okay? It was not because they felt good about it, but because they wanted to spread and they wanted their own people to know the distinctive messages of the movement that they were in. And the early Advent hymns reflected this distinct beliefs and many of the hymn texts is almost as though the writer of the hymn is trying to convince the hearers of the truth contained in it. As I, as I read a lot of this particular hymn texts, you know, it's, people say it's scary and it's so deep and it's so, you know, it's so graphic. But it is because the particular writer has really understood the, the seriousness of the time that they were in. It's also obvious that the early Seventh-day Adventist hymnists had such an intense longing for themes such as the sinner's invaluable experience of salvation and the growing relationship with Christ. And as a result of that experience, the remnant's responsibility is to spread the gospel the messages of the Sabbath, and of the message that Christ is coming very soon. However, unfortunately, the inclusion of the Adventist written hymns in the hymnals has steadily declined over the years. A lot of the hymns that we have sung today has not made it in the 1985 SA hymnal. Also, as you have seen, James White was was writing a lot of um, and compiling a lot of hymnals, but to the, it's 2016, and the last hymnal that we've had is 1985. There's there has no new hymn that has surfaced within our faith, and there has not been any reason to compile another hymn. Furthermore, very few of these hymns have a distinct message that carry the unique Seventh Day Adventist flavor. Many of the more recent hymns are not distinctively Adventist anymore. And that can also be undistinguished when compared with hymns from other denominations. Again, like I'm saying, the hymns, Blessed Assurance, Nothing Between, those are very, very good hymns. And it really helps us in our daily walk with Christ. But where are the hymns that distinctly talks about our faith? Hymns that are written today. The output of Seventh-day Adventist writers, as represented by their hymn texts that appear in the hymnals, is not impressive. Certainly today, Seventh-day Adventist Church needs more Annie Smith, we need more Roswell Cottrells, we need more F.E. Belden's, in the sense that F.E. Belden wrote a lot of hymns. So why do we need Adventist hymns that are distinct? Well, we have learned 
that hymns are the means of communicating the message and theology of the church. Also, it is an avenue for, for passing the heritage of the church. And I'm saddened whenever I visit Seventh-day Adventist churches and I ask them about the doctrines of our faith, a lot of people are quiet and they don't know the answer. Not because they're shy to answer, but because they don't know the answer. Why? Because we are forgetting our distinctive messages. We are forgetting the landmarks. We are forgetting these truths that these pioneers have lived for and were willing to die for. What kind of message, messages then do Seventh-day Adventists send when, our, when we lose our uniqueness? We should sing hymns that represent the peculiarity of our faith and beliefs to plant these truths securely in our memories. Um, you notice that even Moses used that kind of um, instruction. For example, for them to remember the law of God, he had to write it in song. You know, it's easier to remember something when you sing it because it's embedded in the subconscious. And so when we sing these hymns, that are distinct, then we're not gonna forget our message as an Adventist. When hymn books are gone, and at that time will come, our faith in God's goodness will be nurtured by whatever has been rooted deep in us. No less than the Bible verses committed to memory, the hymns that strongly affirm our doctrines will provide us the way in which the Lord leads and instructs us. Um, Ellen White said in early writings, there are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is the present truth that the flock needs now. We need present truth hymns to sing today. We are God's last day church. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven, and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth, also the first and second angels' messages and the third, unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God, seen by his true loving people in heaven, and the ark containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. And I, I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmark. So here, Ellen White was enumerating the landmarks. And as we have sung this morning, a lot of these landmarks are in their songs. And this is the clincher. The Lord has made us the depositors of his law. We are the depositors of his law. He has committed to us sacred and eternal truth, which is to be given to others in faithful warnings, reproofs, and encouragements. And as a musician, the way we can do is by including these kinds of songs and teaching it to others. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world. And so I encourage every one of you, as what you have learned this morning, this is not just precious history that we have learned, not just nice stories that our pioneers have, have done or endured. We are part of this great history. If you want to be a part of it, then let's learn more of what they died for. You know, let's learn more of the truths in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, and we will all be blessed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to close, we'd like to invite the the UP ambassadors are still here. Are you still here? Let's sing a, a song. Dakilang Katapatan. Are we? Right.
these are some of the members of the AP Ambassadors. Some are not here, but we'll try our best to sing the song. By the way, uh, Mrs. Irene is, uh, was a member of the Ambassadors. How many years, Mom Irene? Six years in the AP Ambassadors.
this time I would like to thank Mom Irene for for sharing a very very informative uh, material. And you know what? As I was listening to you, Mom Irene, I think the AUP ambassadors, as we go out for outreach, we should teach these Adventist hymns. What do you think, ambassadors? The music majors, I think we. Uh, we should we should incorporate the learning of this uh, advocacy in our in our classes and during the forum, and we'd like to inspire the music classes. You know, the music ministry classes. We will tell Mam Jamandi, who's not here with us, to uh, teach these hymns in your classes before the end of the semester. So let's give another round of applause to Mam Irene, and uh, we hope that uh, anything that you have again in the future, it just, you know, she, she just told us, she Facebooked me and said, sir, I'll be there this time. If you want, I want to share something. Oh, we love people, especially from the US, to share something, you know, so that we will learn. Thank you very much, ma'am. As we close, we'd like to uh, please stand up and we'll ask uh, Mark to please pray for us. Shall we bow our heads? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. We'd like to thank you for another life and for this. Um, we'd like to thank thee especially for this time that we could revisit the uh, early hymns that was um, composed or created by our forefathers, our the ancestors of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Lord, um, as we seek for. Um, our learning of the truth. Um, may these songs help us, the Lord, as we um, seek for our distinct uh, the messages as Adventists, so that we may be able to spread um, the good news to other people, to spread the, um, your gospel and about your second coming. And now, the Lord, as we depart from this place, we like to ask your holy angels to be with each one of us. Can you keep us safe and as we do our remaining activities this day, can you also guide us, the Lord? Thank you for your love and care. Please forgive our sins that we have done against in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, you have your attendance.